Uh, my name's Jane Raleigh. I am the director of dance programming here at the Kennedy Center. And it's a real pleasure to be able to moderate this discussion today. Um, we're here talking about Reframing the Narrative, which is a project, um, a, a series of programming of our ballet season here that is almost at its conclusion, which is kind of crazy. Uh, we, it is a project that focuses, highlights, celebrates, um, and, and tells the stories of black contributions in classical ballet specifically. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to work on this project for almost two years with these two incredible women sitting on either side of me. So today we're gonna talk um, about our curation around the project um, and share some of how we got here, what we're thinking about, reflecting back on, on where we've been, um, and then open it up for questions from you all. So thanks for being with us. So, First, I just want these women to introduce themselves. Um, when I first had the idea to do a week that focused on black contributions in ballet, it felt like these two women were really the obvious choices to me. Um, and as they introduce your, themselves, you will hear why. Let's start with you, um, Denise. Denise is the president and CEO of IABD, the International Association of Blacks in Dance, and is also the assistant dean at the Chadwick A. Bozeman College of Fine Arts at Howard University. Denise, can you just um, tell us a little bit about IABD and how your organization works to support black dance? Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, the International Association of Blacks in Dance is a dance service organization. It's a membership organization. It's been in existence now for 33, well, let me, let me take that step back. It's produced a conference and festival, <laughs> which actually uh, predates its existence for 33 years. And it's an organization that promotes and preserves dance of African ancestry and origin and provides opportunities in advocacy, education, funding, philosophical dialogue, touring, performances, and many, many, many programs. Uh, the staple event, which I just mentioned, is its uh, annual international conference and festival, and it is what I refer to as a movable feast. It is a uh, event, an experience that travels the country and Canada every year and provides performances, workshops, classes, dialogue, auditions, uh, you name it, we're doing it at the conference. And it pulls together some of the leading dancers, choreographers, educators, scholars, and companies on an annual basis. Um, in addition, we're doing some additional work with dance companies through our Kohai Move, program, which is the Comprehensive Organizational Health Initiative, which is managing uh, organizational vitality and, and endurance. And we have a select number of uh, dance companies that uh, we are working with. Um, they have a cohort of about 30 companies that IABD is funding through a grant from the Mellon Foundation. And this program specifically targets uh, organizational health of organizations, black dance companies. Uh, and in addition to that, we have just launched a new program called Forward, which kind of pushes our bubble around what we think about is an actual dance company and incorporates studios, academies, um, organizations that are doing interdisciplinary work. Um, Teresa, I'm going to talk to Teresa because we need to get her up in there too. Like there, there, there's this program is really doing a lot of great things, and it also incorporates international um, companies as well, and that's um, part of our name, international. And then there are just some other things that we offer: IABD auditions, um, where we have targeted um, specifically ballet dancers of color to uh, link them to and provide opportunities in some of the predominantly historically white. Uh, dance companies, as well as summer intensives and scholarship opportunities, professional development opportunities for a uh, number of companies and organizations that exist um, around the country. So that's just a little, little teaser of what we do. Amazing, thank you. And Teresa, Teresa Ruth Howard is a former dancer herself with Dance Theater of Harlem and is the founder of Mob Ballet, the memoirs of blacks in ballet. Teresa, maybe you could share the impetus behind the founding of Mob Ballet and some of the work that you do there. 
Sure. Um, so, uh, Ma Ballet came about because I have a big mouth, essentially. Um, it was during the period of time when Misty Copeland was making her ascent to um, the role of principal, the rank of principal with American Ballet Theater, and the narrative, we're framing the narrative, around her, the mythology around her uh, that was being presented was that she was the first and she was the only, and that it was true in the space that she was holding, but not in the, under the umbrella of, of Blacks in Ballet. And, um, and so I wrote an article um, entitled The Mysterious Case of the Val Vanishing Ballerinas of Color, Where Have They Gone? And it took on that mythology, that narrative, it lifted up some of the history, and in the, at the end of it I said, you know, if you are a black ballerina or a ballet dancer, or if you know the name of one, leave it in the comments. And so the outpouring was so intense, and the dialogue around it was that it, like, like I knew it had to live somewhere, and so I created um, a space. First it was called the Museum of Blacks and Ballet, but a lawyer told me that the, the word museum in New York is regulated and you cannot even call yourself a museum even if you are digital. <laughs> so I was like, but I had already said Ma Ballet, I was like, ooh, I gotta find an M. So it became memoirs, which I thought was apropos. And so um, generally, I think 360, and I think about when I see problems, I, I like, puzzles, I like to solve problems. And so one of the first things was like, we're invisible. So how do we do that? So I took all the names that, was gener that were generated from that comment yeah. section and that became the roll call. The next thing was the history. Like people, are, people including the press, the media, us, don't know our history. And so I was like, well, maybe we should make a timeline of data points that tell us about this Black Valley history. I thought it was important that we juxtapose it against the other happenings in the world at that time, right? Because oftentimes the way that Black Valley history or just Black history is taught is segmented, right? There's like a unit outside of everything else that we call history. Um, and so I thought, if people knew what was happening the year that Arthur Mitchell, for instance, was promoted to principal at New York City Ballet, how would it impact their understanding of that particular data point? Um, it, for me, explained both the scarcity and the, the wonder that, there, that these data points even exist. So we have that. We also have, um, in I think it was 29? 2020, we launched something called the Constellation Project, which uh, maps the intersectionality between black ballet artists and anybody that they came in contact with. In the artistic world, institutions, foundations, um, um, for, for funding, anything like that, because I wanted to um, illustrate the humanity in black artists right, because that's when we talk about Black Lives Matter, oftentimes we're not acknowledging the humanity. So those are the digital components, as well as the, the installations that we do that, have, that tell stories like, and, uh, and Still They Rose, The Legacy of Black Philadelphians in Ballet. I like long titles. <laughs> anyway, but that's the digital component. And then, um, again, Thinking 360, I work with um, ballet organizations internationally um, around the world to talk up to leadership, dancers, whoever will listen, about um, the concepts around diversity, equity, inclusion, specifically through the lens of the art, right? Because I noticed that the conversations about diversity um, inside ballet organizations specifically they were being trained, but they were landing because the culture of ballet itself is almost larger than anything else inside those organizations. And if you don't talk about how, for instance, institutionalized racism is embedded inside ballet itself, then organizations don't necessarily tap into it, doesn't connect. Um, so I have the Cultural Competence and Equity Coalition. We're now 10 organizations that come together for cohort learning. Um, I've developed a whole curriculum that we're moving through in a one year period of time. In August, we have our symposium. I've done, I did one before COVID, and then COVID made an in-person 
symposium impossible. So, but it was the middle of BLM and the world was on fire and we needed a little bit of healing. And so I held a digital symposium. We had over 2,000 people attend with 15 sessions over three, over three weeks. Um, and now we're back in person August 7th through the 13th in Miami, hosted by Sanctuary of the Arts. And it has everything from a ballet track, which you know we give our kids, they get a mentor, a personal mentor. They have personal development, history, um, physical therapy. Um, we share films with them. I have an educator's track, which will help um, black organizations, black studios, to build their ballet curriculum and their businesses because if they're robust, then the, the dance pipeline, the professional pipeline will be robust. We have a scholars program this year um, where scholars are presenting work and having dialogue around the conversation of ballet and this transformational period. And finally, we have the choreographic um, program called Pathways to Performance, of which Donald Byrd, who's with us today, um, is the lead mentor on that. And so young choreographers of color will be able to work with Donald Byrd, Helen Pickett, and Jennifer Archibald and learn crafting. And we have two companies, uh, Ballet Austin and Nashville Ballet, who are willing and excited to offer second company contracts, choreographic contracts to those who they feel like they connect with their work. So uh, it's a 360 sort of thing that Ma Ballet does and, and whenever I find a problem, I'm gonna try to find a solution. So hearing all of those incredible things that these two women are working on, you can see why I wanted to bring them into the fold to work on this project. Um, so, I, I'd love us to dig into the why, why we're doing this. Um, I'll share a little bit about, from, for, for me, from the Kennedy Center perspective, this season, the 21-22 season, is our 50th anniversary season. And so at the start of this year, um, the curatorial provocation really from the, the institution was to look back and celebrate history and everything that's come before, but also to look forward and um, ask questions, make statements about what you think the future is of, of your form. And so to me, um, the Kennedy Center has a deep history and has had a deep history with Dance Theater of Harlem and the legacy of Arthur Mitchell, both through uh, performances with the company, but also through a long-standing educational residency program that Mr. Mitchell used to lead. Um, but also, uh, as you said, it was the summer of BLM, this racial reckoning in the country, and the, all these conversations um, in the ballet field always seem a little behind the rest of society, in, in my opinion. Um, and so it felt like an opportunity to take that piece of history and be able to say, uh, we need to shine a light on this, we need to tell these stories that have been here that haven't been told, um, and, and we need everyone to really focus on this. Um, so digging into some of the other whys, uh, Denise, you curated uh, working with the three companies that, that you'll have seen if you've seen a performance already or if you're coming to join us for the rest of the weekend, uh, Dance Theater of Harlem, Bal Ethnic Dance Company, and Collage Dance Collective who have joined us for these shows together. Why these companies? Why did you want to bring them together on one program? Well, uh, one main reason, of course, is, um, as you just mentioned, Legacy and Arthur Mitchell and their connection to Dance Theater of Harlem. Each of those uh, directors for those companies, Bell Ethnic and Collage Dance Collective, are disciples of Arthur Mitchell. They've had the opportunity to learn from and be a part of their uh, his organization. And at the same time, after doing um, or having their career with Dance Theater of Harlem, started their own companies. Um, Waverly Lucas and Nina Gilreath started um, Ball Ethnic in Atlanta, Georgia, after having danced with Dance Theater of Harlem and actually Atlanta Ballet. And they have been doing this work for 32, I think they said, 32 years now with Ball Ethnic. And then right behind is Kevin Thomas and Marcellus Harper. And Kevin and Marcellus started in New York. New York was already fertile ground. And they said, well, where else can we go? Where can we take what we're doing? And they landed in Memphis, Tennessee, down in the south. And so uh, 
Collage Dance Collective, just 10 years old, I guess now 11 years old, they have just, uh, again, established themselves as one of the premier uh, black ballet companies in the South, along with uh, Ethnic. So for me, it was kind of a no-brainer. It was certainly an opportunity for these two organizations to come to Washington, D.C. to be presented on our national stage for our National Performing Arts Center. And there is, again, a direct connection and a history um, for these organizations that lead uh, us to look at, historically, what they've been doing, where they've been doing, where they've been doing it, and just, again, the, the connection to Mr. Mitchell. Um, here, this, I think, again, this, this moment um, is long time coming mm -hmm. and long overdue for these organizations who are very, very deeply rooted in community and the work that they've been doing and the, the stellar dancers that they continue to produce and the work that you see on stage. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Teresa, your curation focused on uh, a new world premiere that we um, premiered for the first time on Tuesday uh, with choreographer Donald Byrd and 11 dancers who we brought in from all over the world. Can you share um, why Donald Byrd, why these dancers, and, and why put them together in a space? Absolutely. So again, I, I, I mentioned that I work with a lot of companies, and so, when I work, I work with leadership, but I also speak to a lot of dancers, right? And so, and having been a dancer, um, I know what that is. I know what that is to be in a predominantly white training environment, feel like you're the only one, feel the pressure of the world, you represent your whole race with your arabesque, you know, and true. And <laughs> fall out of a pure white, like that's why black people can't do ballet. Um, and and, and we, we laugh, but it, it that's, that is the subtext, right? And so um, the idea that, again, where this flashpoint that we're talking about, about BLM, really we were talking to leadership, but it was the first time that dancers, because there was COVID, they were home. They didn't have to worry about casting or bumping into somebody in the hallway. They started to really share their stories. Um, and I have, relationships with them, I hear. And so when you presented this opportunity, I know that my experience at Dance Theater of Harlem was very different because although the culture of ballet was larger than the culture of blackness in that organization, there was still the culture of blackness, right? So blackness wasn't necessarily the issue. Um, and I said, well, what would happen if we could pull together some of these artists that are dancing in these companies across the country, across the world, and give them that sort of experience of dancing in a space that was created and designed for them, but also, because I'm interested in shifting the culture of ballet, we're gonna set the actual culture of that space up differently, right? Because then what happens when you take the weight of blackness off of their shoulders, what happens when you take the weight of judgment off of their shoulders, what happens when they are in a space when they know that they're wanted and they don't have to fight for anything, right? Like what happens to their artistry? What happens to their human, their beingness? Um, and then I thought, I will also wanna give them an artistic process. And so that's where Donald Byrd comes in to play. So Donald Byrd and I worked together in the 1900s, and, and he was the first person that, I, I'd say that he birthed my artist because as a ballet dancer, my intellect, I've always been this person, right? Like I always thought, felt, thought this deeply, but my humor showed up in the ballet space as a safety mechanism. And so everybody thought I was silly. Like if you ask anybody who knows me from my, they'd be like crazy Teresa, she's still crazy, but crazy like mad, like genius, right? That's different. But Donald was the first person that I worked with that was like, no, that's essential, that you bring your full authentic self, your point of view, your perspective into the space because it informs your movement and the movement doesn't work if it's not in the space. It's not authentic and it's not real. And I said, what would happen if those dancers inhabited that space? 
and had the, and also Donald's work, especially now, deals with issues of social justice, right? And he has this incredible ability to have these deeply intellectual, kind of probing, provocative conversations with artists inside the process. And I was like, that's what we need. We need dancers to know that they're allowed to think, they're allowed to speak, um, and that they're essential. Their whole being is essential. And so I asked Donald, and, and he said yes. And so we embarked on this process with these dancers from across America. I wanted dancers from what, is, what are considered to be regional companies, because now in ballet, regional is a dirty word. And for me, since doing, I was a scholar at, at Jacob's Pillow on the Ballet Across America program, and I took the, the, the stance that, you know, if you don't understand, if you don't understand American ballet unless you understand regionality, because that's how we get American ballet. Mm -hmm. And it's really vital that it's in the DNA, like you're named after your city and it used to mean something. And I wanted to lift that up because I thought that, you know, the dancers at New York City Ballet or ABT or even San Francisco Ballet, they get so many opportunities because they're from the larger companies. But these dancers who are in these regional companies are holding it down for blackness in ballet and oftentimes not known in the, in the same way. And I think that what's beautiful about the piece is that they are so incredibly brilliant that you wonder why you didn't know their names, mm -hmm. right? And so that was sort of my thought and, you know, it paid off. <laughs> <laughs> A colleague actually wrote me that the other day, that um, he, he said seeing them in that, he's seen a lot of the companies that these dancers come from, and the main question he was left with after seeing the work was, why don't all of these dancers have solo roles in their, in their home companies all the time? So hopefully you That's have a, a similar That's a whole experience. another conversation. I know. <laughs> but it really does, yeah. uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, thank you. So I, I wanna, uh, you said the word process. I want us to dig into process too. Um, one of the things that was really special to me about this curatorial team element was that it wasn't just about what you see on the Opera House stage. So much of um, what we call curation is what are the performances. And so much of this was not that. We talked about um, process behind the scenes at the Kennedy Center, but also process of what it was gonna feel like in the studio and look like. So Teresa, I actually, I wanna stay with you for a moment about the, the Donald Byrd process. Can you share some of those elements, conversational elements, um, and what you did in the space to really build the process outside of the beautiful final product that's on stage? Sure. Like, I what was interesting was the process of choosing the dancers. Mm. So for me, it was really important that they had agency. Um, I didn't want the, the idea of like, so-and-so is performing courtesy of, right? Like, they are humans, they are adults, even if they're not treated <laughs> like adults all the time. And so I said, Jane, can we write the artistic directors first and ask them if they will release the dancer, like if there's conflict, and then if they release them, only then will we go to the dancer and say, hey, do you wanna do this project? And then they can, with a clear path, decide if they wanted to or they didn't. That was interesting, because some artistic directors completely fell in line with that, sure, and others needed to insert themselves in the process, right? Interesting, but, after we selected the dancers, I said to Donald, I was like, Donald, I want you to give them the Donald Bird process, which is, this is the process that nearly broke me. You know, he has a way of, uh, there are different ways he generates um, movement, but there's a really specific way that in, in, we say the 80s, 90s, you know, he creates a phrase, there's thing, you insert things in a phrase, there's retrograde, right? There's inversions, there's all these sort of choreographic tools that he uses that requires not only the dancer to participate in a different way, because you're not just given steps, you gotta figure it out, but it's also collaborative, right? And so what was interesting, oh, we also had a lot of conversations with the dancers before, because they did not trust us. <laughs> they didn't trust it, I, I wouldn't trust it either. But after they understood the intention, they came into the space egoless, completely open, and like 
a little fangirl, fanboy, fan they <laughs> out, right? Like, because they know each other from Instagram. But they fell into this beautiful sort of harmony of appreciation. And through the process of generating material and, and having to work together, they really began to look like a company literally within hours. And when I say hours, when I tell you that we had a 12 day sort of process, by day three, Mr. Bird had not only completed the piece, but had added an extra five minutes. So that's how quickly they were working together. It's a testament to how skilled they are, how intelligent they are, how willing and open they are, and the fact that when you put a whole bunch of black people who are used to working twice as hard to get half as much in a room, we can do it in half the time. I'm done. Damn. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and Denise, a huge part of the process and a lot of the conversations we had was about how to dig in and expand this into the entire Kennedy Center, not just the dance programming team and the three of us. Um, so we had conversations with marketing and press, our education teams, um, a lot about ticketing. Can you share about some of those conversations and what some of your goals were in, in pushing there? Sure. This isn't about window dressing. This experience is not window dressing. It's the full experience. And we talked in depth about it being the full experience and making sure that the Kennedy Center really committed completely and entirely to creating an experience for us that involved all elements and not necessarily just window dressing. So what does it mean to have conversations about marketing to the audiences, because Dance Theater of Harlem has an audience, Collage has an audience, Ethnic has an audience. What does that marketing look like? What does it involve? Who are we talking to? What are we presenting? You know, those were the deep conversations, the educational components. Of course, the Kennedy Center certainly is working with certain groups, but looking beyond the, the, the normal groups that, uh, uh, that are here on a consistent basis. So do we go, how do we go outside of the norm? And who are we reaching and who are we talking to? And so really kind of digging our heels into the process of thinking differently and outside of the box than you normally would with presenting here at the Kennedy Center. Um, specifically, one of the conversations I recall, because this is um, something that I often talk about with companies, is certainly around the funding and what other angles can we look at presenting an organization. Dance Theater of Harlem, as well as IBD and Collage, had received Mackenzie Scott dollars. That's another way for us to present our organizations, not just window dressing. What's the meat? How are these organizations continuing to strive and maintain and sustain their organizations? So could we talk to Forbes about that? Would Forbes be interested in talking um, and learning about these organizations from that perspective? So really thinking, again, holistically in the process uh, about how we educate our audiences educate the people within the Kennedy Center to think differently about these uh, organizations um, from different perspectives. Um, so really teasing and, and just what, what are the, the stories that are also coming from these organizations, uh, particularly, for example, with Bal Ethnic, we had a young woman who had done our IABD auditions. Right, and so the IBD auditions led her to working with Bal Ethnic. There was another story for one of your um, young dancers, Raquel, who came through the IBD auditions and is now an apprentice, is that right? At Nashville Ballet, and yep. John, Jonathan, Jonathan Filbert is actually, he got his contract with, with Atlanta Ballet like through the through, auditions. Yeah, so these are some of the stories and the ways that we wanted to present and, and talk just a little bit differently about how we would market, uh, how we would fundraise, you know, all, all of these um, uh, different ways uh, of uh, getting the message out. Can I share a little bit about the press conversation? Because I think that what, what we did made a difference. So 
the meetings. As a, as a journalist <laughs> myself, understanding what the, what the pitch is, right? Um, and how it grabs a writer and how they decide to write about it. You are actually writing it for them. You're writing the arc for them, the angle. And so I was really um, interested in the way that this, with the way the pitches that were going out to the different venues, right, mm -hmm. the different outlets, mm -hmm. were going to be crafted. Because if you, if you do that from a DEI, you know, just blacks in ballet, flat platitude, then that's what you're going to get. And I am not wanted more than trying that. to hear, yes. read another one of those. Yeah. But instead, working really closely with, with Brittany, um, who is the PR director, uh, PR rep. rep. She, we, we really workshop the idea of what needs to be in the pitches. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, <laughs> Miss Sarah Kaufman from the Washington Post um, clearly gets one of those pitches. She bites, she interviews, she you know, goes through all the machinations that happens and then the article comes out and I, I knew that, that we were right because she actually got it in tone, in sentiment. She heard what I was saying, what Donald was saying, what the dancers were saying, what the intent of this, this was, beyond just, oh, there's black dancers at the, you know, black ballet dancers at the Kennedy, Kennedy Center. Center. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's a learning that the Kennedy Center takes away from this whole process. And I think that that's happened in almost every different department that we engage with. And I will say that everybody was so willing and so open and like hungry for enthusiastic about like looking at things differently. And people just kept pitching things <laughs> into the pot. And, and, and this is the result. So I, I hope that this is a new way that the Kennedy Center can reframe their narrative <laughs> about how it, it, it works internally. Yeah, one of the things I really appreciated and that I think we will carry forward is that um, because we were having all of these conversations, it required us as the center to slow down our pace. Because we're doing so many things all of the time, we have a very easy like, and this is how we do marketing, and this is how we do the pitches, and this is what we do for ticket discounts, and then that is just done, and we move on to the next thing. And I think partially because we had a curatorial team where we had to talk about everything as all of us, and also because we were pushing on these things, it forced us all to say, anything where you say this is our usual thing, you don't get to say that for this. Right. And I think all of us have been changed by that. And it will be something that I, just last night at intermission, our social media team member, our PR rep, and I were standing in the lobby and they were like, Jane, we, we had a conversation the other day and we have some ideas that we want to talk about over the summer while it's quiet so that we can implement them for next year. So yeah, <laughs> we're doing it, we're That's doing great. it, it's awesome. That's great. So taking us to that place of reflection, because we've been having all of these conversations and now tomorrow is the last day of this version of Reframing the Narrative, um, I would love us to just, all three of us, take a moment to reflect. Um, what have you noticed? Are there specific moments in time that are sticking with you from these last three weeks? Um, is there a, a comment you've heard or something you've seen that you'd like to share. Before we go there, though, can I, can we just do one more, th one, Please. a couple other points? Um, the other areas of pushing the envelope. If you saw the performance already, you knew we had a black conductor. Um, we also pushed for our management team, stage management and production management, to incorporate people of color. Uh, so this really was again a 360, as Teresa was saying, in terms of just making sure that we were getting all the buttons, tapping all the buttons, making sure that everyone was included in some way and that there was voice from all sides of this production, um, this production at the Kennedy Center. And that's real important. That doesn't typically happen here. This is a union facility. And so we know there's those conversations that happen. But again, you all were just gracious enough to say, okay, let's do it. Yeah. 
I was thinking it's very powerful on stage when the conductors come out to bow with the companies. And again, you just see the, sol the, uh, the choir that sings with yes. Gloria is a predominantly black chorus. The soprano soloist is, is a black woman. So just as everyone comes out to bow, you just see this continuous mm -hmm. parade of black excellence on the stage. And it's, it's yes, awesome. we didn't want to break the line. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So reflection. <laughs> reflection. Oh, reflection. Okay. Yes. There, I have. I have this in two parts, right? Because there was the residency part, which was like two weeks, right? And then the, where the where we were kind of like by ourselves, and then there's show week where like all the companies come in, and so the residency week was interesting because we created this little world, a bubble, right? Like it's it's completely experimental. It worked. And the dancers really bonded. There was a real specific energy. They entered this space. The first day they were a little pulled up and like, I don't know what's happening here. And then in a couple of days, they were just loud and boisterous in their full selves and felt completely at home here, right? Um, and before we went into that group space, I was like, hold on to this, because this is something that, you know, the three companies coming in for, specifically for like, you know, Dance State of Harlem, an iteration of it has been here. Um, but for collage and for Balethnic, this is a big thing. And there's like a lot associated with this. But if you have to hold the space like you know what it is, you, you've built it, mm -hmm. right? That it is home, that people want you to succeed. And, and it's warm. And so I think that that happened, that there was a, a, a huge communion, communion watching company classes, watching them applauding one another when in normal ballet classes it would be sizing people up. That to me, I'm interested in the performances. Yes, the performances need to go well. But for me, when I'm thinking about the work that I do in order to shift the culture of ballet from the inside out, I have to shift people. And I watched those, I watched them shift to be supportive to lay down their egos and just celebrate one another. And I think that you can feel it mm -hmm. in the performance, right? And I think that that for me is the biggest win, is I think they can all go back to, you know, the residency dancers can all go back to their respective companies. The three companies can go back to their homes and know that this moment in time existed, it's real, we made it, mm -hmm. we can make it again, and that they own that experience, right? And so they can use whatever that is to transform any space that they're in. Um, and so that's, I think, I don't know if that, that's, what I, that's how I, I'm experiencing it. Yeah. I could just be completely wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, two things. Uh, typically, um, backstage on the way to go take our seats, a dancer will stop me and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for creating the space in the community. Thank you for allowing me to just be myself, be my authentic self. Um, that's like, <laughs> yeah. You deserve every moment right. of this. Like any other dancer or any other person, you deserve it. You are deserving. Second, I would say standing in the theater or sitting in my seat and having a little black girl <laughs> sitting next to me who literally is like this <laughs> the entire show. Mommy, do you see that? They're beautiful. They look, I mean, I hear that every night every day in the theater. That's amazing. Today, just the little girls, I don't know if you saw them, like <laughs> with the yellow and the pink dresses on, like it was amazing to see these young people who, you know, know that they can go get a pair of ballet slippers and start their career. And it's something that's real for them. 
and, real. And in the nation's theater, you're talking about like, it looked like Easter Sunday. It did. <laughs> and like people were just cheesing, uh-huh. taking pictures. And, you know, and, and this mm-hmm. is the nation's theater. Yeah. Right? So the idea that we can come in and feel comfortable enough to come in, because oftentimes these spaces feel very intimidating no matter who you are, if you're not normally in them, but also that you can see yourself reflected You don't feel like you want to rush home. Like people were really sort of hanging out Mm -hmm. and just taking in, drinking Mm -hmm. it in. And I think that that's when you talk about audience development, when you talk Mm -hmm. about, you know, when through their email they get something from the Kennedy Center, that is their experience. And so they're more likely to come to something else, even if it's not specifically, and this was not even specifically designed for anybody, right? It re- it's it's for reflective everyone. and, s- and mm-hmm. celebratory, but it's for everybody. And I think the audience reflects that. Yeah. But I think that, that it will be interesting to see how many people's perceptions of the Kennedy Center itself are shifted because this program, this programming felt a certain way. Mm-hmm. As a wraparound and not just what's on stage. Yes. It, it just feels a little bit different in the lobby. Yes. 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 So we have to say to Ms. Rudder, we'd like a meeting because this cannot be just the only time. <laughs> and speaking to that comfort in the audience, I feel like my main reflection that I take away is the energy that was in the house on opening night on Tuesday. Um, and again, it's like it's also in two parts. Um, the, I think even being an audience member for ballet can be intimidating because you're supposed to like clap when the thing is impressive, but if you don't know which thing is impressive, then you're like, should I be clapping right now? Everyone else is quiet, I don't know. And that was like totally gone on Tuesday. People were like clapping at every lift, cheering when like a group of people ran out. They're like, they look great in those costumes, like cheering. The energy was like, my, the orchestra manager even said to me, it sounded like a rock concert in the opera house tonight. Because people were cheering that loud at just like little moments, which felt so different and so special. And I realized like everyone feels comfortable here to just voice their excitement and their approval. And then also the the closing act was the new, the world premiere of the new Donald Byrd work. And when that, the music is incredibly, um, has a lot of space in it. It's very ethereal and very quiet. And it had been loud and boisterous, and when the curtain went up on that, it was like the audience went like, and it was 22 minutes of just like silent staring at the stage, and it erupted at the end. That like the dichotomy of those two things, it was it was epic. I will hold that. Donald Burr likes to say like, black audiences will let you know where they stand, <laughs> because they will be like yes, and then they'll be like. Or worse. Um, And it's okay, like that's the thing. There's the the culture of the theater, Mm -hmm. right? And the thing that like you're wrong if you don't know where to clap or you you do. What happens if we can eradicate that and Mm -hmm. we can just appreciate, like we don't have a judgment about how you're appreciating, Mm -hmm. right? What does that shift in terms of how the space feels and if it's, you know, inclusive? That's a question, and, and for theaters, it's harder because it's another step of education, and how do you do that, right? I think about the Royal Opera House. It's like, how do you make the Royal Opera House feel like it's not the Royal Opera House, <laughs> right? And, and that is a task that they, that they have taken on by opening it up and making it feel like it's just like a meeting place. And, it's another way of thinking about how you do, pro- like programming 360. And you're not just programming for programming, like for programming's sake, you're programming the space to feel a certain way at all times so that people feel like they can enter and they can go, well, what is this about, you know? Yeah. Welcoming for all. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. With that, I'd love to open it to questions if anyone has questions. Yeah. Here. 
yeah, the question was, what happens next? Um, yeah, from my perspective, um, a, a moment of reflection, and then I have like 500 versions of it in my head that I kind of want to just like blurt out to everyone that I know and see which ones of those stick with people. I, I was literally just thinking like, I want to have meetings with both of you after to just ask like, what, what do you think the next version of this looks like? Or, and or like, how do the things we learned from this just carry into everything we do because there's there's one version of it in my mind where we do these big celebratory moments to shine a big spotlight on blackness in ballet, but also if we're getting at real change, then it shouldn't just be every six years we do a festival version like this. Um, so I have a lot of questions and ideas about how it may just slowly embed into everything and change in a larger, slower sense. You see how everything I'm saying just ends in a question as I stare into, the, into space. That's sort of how I'm feeling. I don't know, what do you think? For me, it comes down to the work I do. I always go, what is your organizational identity? Right? And so, like, oftentimes people are like, we need a DEI structure. I go, no, you got good bones. What you need is to have those bones permeated by this, by these tenets, right? As a way of being, embodying them. And so I think that this is a great exercise to go like, oh, now we have experienced ourselves this way. We know that this works in this context. Then how do we, do we want to apply it? How do we apply it um, principally across the board? And I love a, I love the idea of it being like a splashy thing, but if we're gonna make this normative, right, then then it needs to figure out a way to be organically integrated into just so that people are just like, oh yeah, this is what it is, um, and then maybe we could have like a five. Like, Remember when it wasn't? This is why. This is the thing that changed it. Um, but for me, that's what I I would like, and maybe that's programmatically step by step and figuring out a real strategy of how do we sprinkle this through everything and then start mixing. I am constantly learning. I, I'm not an expert in anything. I am constantly in the learning space. I don't assume that I know anything. I don't consider myself a historian. People are like, you're a historian. I go, I'm really not. I play one on TV. Like, I am constantly discovering. I am constantly learning. And in fact, what you see on, you know, in, on Ma Ballet on the site, that's, that's a a group effort from both the community and for myself, and there's some volunteers that work with me. So I'm always discovering. Like, I, we just launched the Capitol Ballet Orbit, and it was, we did it very quickly, and we found this, um, this Ford um, Congressional Library um, document that had all these pictures and all this information. It was just like really too much information to even figure out how to put it together in time, so that is an orbit that will expand. But learning about um, the idea that Carmen de Lava, like, well one, that Capitol Ballet premiered um, here, when the, the inaugural year, in an opera called Bendix uh, Sensi, Sensi, Beatrix Sensi. Beatrix Sensi, like that was incredible. Um, just learning all of the, just everything. Like there's, I don't know this stuff. I only know it because I have to engage with it. Um, so I'm constantly shocked and amazed at the who and the connections. So, so yeah, every day.
with Vernon Duke, and it's on the site. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> you want to say, that's, that's history that's on the IABD website as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, do, I just want to highlight, thank you, I, I just want to highlight, um, because you made the point about with this program now, we all have to know, we all have to see, we all have to remember. One of the things that we um, have been talking a lot about is that we've assembled a lot of resources from the IBD website, from Mob Ballet, all in a, a holding page on the Kennedy Center's website called Reframing the Narrative, and we hope that that will be something that continues to live on, that we continue to add to, so that as people hear and remember about this week of programming, or three weeks of programming, that they also have access to link to all these other resources that have existed but um, maybe haven't been all together in, in one spot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, <laughs> yeah, my vision. We talked about that. Yeah, we definitely, I, I don't know, like, formally anything, but it's been really cool. We've all been talking about how we've been seeing and hearing um, on social media and from our colleagues, all of our colleagues in the field, um, interest from people. I, I have received messages from agents and also some from some presenters just saying, congratulations, this looks ex extremely exciting. And hopefully that means that they're following along with what it has been and, and all the things that are part of it. Um, I know there have been some other conversations, and we certainly have seen on social media uh, people commenting like, is this going to be live streamed, and because it hasn't, then people saying, I really wish this could come to my city, so I hope so. How do we normalize? How do we see this in the season? Just like we see New York City Ballet every year, we see American Ballet Theater every year. If we really talk, if we want to talk about really shifting the programming. Yes. Yes, yes and. Oh, love it. There's lots of, yes. yes. Yeah. I could talk for 10 hours <laughs> about that question. <laughs> In my mind, it can be, if, as a creative, it can be anything. You just need an opportunity. You need interest, opportunity, and you need resources. And so it's limitless, right? Like it's, that's why I always say, drafting a new blueprint for ballet and beyond, because Ballet is, for me, is just the particular mechanism, right? The tool that's, that's showing you that this can actually work, period. And so you can take, I'm interested in building models. I'm Legoing it. I want to build models that work 
in one context, but you can absolutely take them to another context, maybe shift a couple through a couple things, and then it works in another context. People just need to be shown, right? So there's a couple things like people like the data, right? So you need people need to feel it experientially, and then you need the data to show that it will sell, that people want it. And then after you have those things, generally you can move something else forward, right? And if it's really good, then somebody, everybody's clamoring to get at you or trying to steal it, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, or replicate it in another way, right? So then you know you, you're on to something. But it can be absolutely anything. All you need is people who are willing and interested and some resources. Because it, it can live anywhere. It, does, it can be these companies, it can be these dancers, it can be whatever. Yeah. Well, I, I want to maybe just pull one thing out of this, though, that I have been struggling with, though, as a part of this process. Um, with IBD and, and knowing the many companies that exist within this community, the larger question for me always comes down to the resources and the systemic issues and challenges that we continue to face, even with these wonderful opportunities. This has been a marvelous three weeks, but tomorrow everyone goes back home. And the challenges that they face at home are systemic. And so how do we begin to look at that systems change that really needs to happen in our field, in this country? It's wonderful to be presented here, but it's even more wonderful for you to go home and have the same opportunities within your home base and not have to worry about those things when you get back. Um, it's a conversation to have and to kind of continue to just think about how we look at the systems that drive the work that we do and how we can continue to change them. This certainly elevates and makes it visible on a national platform, but we really have to also push those persons um, who hold, I guess, the keys, the keys, who hold the purse strings, we really have to push them different. Okay. To be different. I have an and idea. And think differently. This is what we're gonna do. And do differently. This is what we're gonna do. I think that part of what a next phase could be is not about program programming. I think using the weight um, and the gravitas of the Kennedy Center to begin a series of real conversations within fu for funders and presenters and all that. They, like they're not in the process. Like companies are in process in a process of learning about DEI and X Y Z and Q R L M N O P. But the funding system is still the system, and so I think that. Perhaps a series, a workshop, where you invite all of those different entities to have a real conversation around what, are, what, what the systemic issues are. And they need to be together, and they need to be, it needs to be a space where they can actually be told about themselves, but also a safe space, because everybody in those organizations, they already know what the issues are, right? It's the question of who's gonna actually make the change. And so you have to shift, we have to figure out who the people are that you need to shift in order, you only need one cog to shift. And then it starts something. But I think that that is something that we can, we can do that will generate energy, energy in these other spaces that haven't, to my knowledge, right? Really been challenged and pushed, because everybody's, everybody's scared, right? Like you're gonna challenge a funder, really? Really? Yeah. And apply? No, yeah. and apply? Like, it needs to be, you know, the whole thing about, like, you can't use this, the master's <laughs> tools to dismantle the master's house. I think you kind of need the master's tools sometimes. <laughs> but the master needs to be using their own tools to undo their own house, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that that's, 
like part of what could possibly be a next immediate step is like, hey, you, you this we had this experience and this is what we've identified. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm looking up at the audience. Uh, Adriana Ray, who is a development director for the International Association of Blacks in Dance. <laughs> she and I have these conversations, and um, what you named Teresa is actually something I said to Adriana. I was like, we just need to get them all in a room. I just want to talk to them. I just want to tell them about themselves. But you're absolutely right. The, 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 the change has to, it has to happen now. It's, yeah. Yeah, well, I think to Deborah. me... Hello, Deborah. Hello, yeah. Deborah. Well, that's what I was going to say, is I think what's been fascinating for me as I step into the role of director of dance programming is to ask this question. We, we often call ourselves the nation's performing arts center without a definition of what that really is. And, and all the members of my team are like, within the first two months of working here, we're like, what does that mean? We're the nation's performing arts center. So I've been contemplating that and like, what is the role of a theater who on the surface, our main job is to take existing works and put them on a stage for an audience. What is actually, what does it actually mean to be the nation's performing arts center, to lead from the position of the nation's performing arts center? Um, and it, it's things like this. And I think that's a great to place <laughs> to wrap us up. We thank you so much for joining us. If you haven't seen Reframing the Narrative yet, or if you haven't seen Program B, because it is an epic program, if you already saw Program A, it's totally different. Um, we have a show tonight at 7.30 in the Opera House and our final closing performance tomorrow at 1.30 and there are still tickets available. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. And we look forward to talking with you. Thank you.